Welcome everyone. I would like to start by thanking the organizers of this conference for keeping it running during these times. My name is Francisco Garcia Flores and I'm going to present to you some very recent developments on both experimental and theoretical work involving two-dimensional semiconductors, specifically cadmium selenide nanoplatelets. First, I'm going to present a very short introduction to the motivation for using these materials in the first place. Two-dimensional semiconductors have many applications. Uh, specifically, one of them is optoelectronic devices. These devices are characterized for converting light to electric current, like for example solar cells and photosensors, and also electric current to light, like for example in lasers or LEDs. As you can see, these are just four examples of widely used technologies, so any improvements to any of them would have very important consequences. Also, here I, I want to say that the recent interest into these materials is because of improved manufacturing, which means that first it is cheaper and second easier to fabricate these samples. Therefore, more experiments and more theory can be performed. Now, we have semiconductors, so I can introduce what an exciton is. In semiconductors, there are conduction and valence bands in which electrons and holes can form. These electrons and holes can then f uh, bound together into a quasi-stable state that we denote as an exciton. Because of the many applications of optoelectronic devices, depending on which one we focus, we might want or not uh, to have excitons in the semiconductor. Therefore, we need to understand when and how are they formed and when and how do they break up. For easy visualization of the excitons, we can think of them as uh, two-dimensional hydrogen atoms, but with very different masses. I would like to then show a schematic view of the experimental setup, in which the sample is a solution that contains nan the cadmium selenide nanoplatelets. Each of these nanoplatelets is a few tens of nanometers in lateral size and then about one nanometer in perpendicular size, which helps the two-dimensional confinement of the electrons, holes and excitons. Using these samples, we are going to focus on pump probe experiments. These, uh, these experiments are characterized by using first a pump laser that excites the electrons and holes that then can bound into these excitons and then a probe lasers to learn more information about the system. Because we cannot directly measure densities of electrons, holes and excitons, what we are going to do is to use the probe laser to measure a change in complex conductivity of the material. This is, this is so because the complex conductivity depends on the amount of electrons and holes, that is free charges, and excitons in the system. While the free charges mainly change the amplitude of the, of the probe field, the excitons also change the phase. So with this with this information and a separate model that connects the complex conductivity to densities, we can check with experiment if our theory is correct. Then, I would like to start presenting what is our theory. Our work focuses on deriving a simple thermodynamical model to describe each of the species in the material, that is, free charges and excitons. It assumes that free charges and excitons separately behave as ideal gases, however, they are, they are coupled. They are coupled because the free charges produce screening into the electron-hole interactions that bound the exciton together. Due to this, the binding energy of the exciton changes depending on the density of free charges and therefore the amount of all of them is coupled together. How exactly can we describe this screening is by looking at the case of only one electron and one hole bound together in a background of other free charges. Uh, this is similar to introducing a screening length for each species in an, into the Coulomb interaction between electron and holes. 
here you can see that the we, that the screened potential that describes the electron hole interaction is in part the bare three-dimensional Coulomb potential and then it has uh, the extra contribution from the screening lengths. Note that the the screening lengths depend on the momentum of the electron hole interaction and the, the uh, density of free charges in the background. Using this screen potential, we can then solve in the Schrodinger equation for the bound state that corresponds to the exciton, and therefore determine the binding energy. First, let's look at uh, the potential in real space. In this figure, we can see that when there are no background free charges, we recover the Coulomb potential, but as we keep increasing it, the, the potential becomes more and more screened. However, it is very important to notice here that in the limit in which background free charges goes to infinity, the potential is not fully screened, but it actually goes to a given curve, as you can see in the figure. This means that we, we expect the binding energy to also behave in a similar way. As we keep increasing the, the amount of charges, of free charges in the background, it should convert to, an, to a value. That we can see in this next figure, in which we show, we plot in the x-axis the amount of free, free charges in the background, and in the y-axis the, the binding energy for, of the exciton for several temperatures. As you can see at the left, so very few background free charges, we recover always the binding energy given by the Coulomb potential, but as we keep increasing the number of charges, we reach a saturation binding energy. This is a very important result because it is extremely different from the three-dimensional case in which we find that excitons can break up when the amount of free charges is high enough. In two dimensions, as we can see here, there is always a bound state. In order to, exp to compare with experiments, we must use the same variables. Instead of the density of free charges in the background, which of course sets the band energy of the excitons and therefore the density of excitons, we must use the photoexcitation density, which is connected to the pump laser. This photoexcitation density is the amount of photons that hit the sample and then produce an electron hole pair. Therefore, the density of free charges in the material and the density of excitons has to be equal to this photoexcitation density. Now, because we can't, uh, we don't know how many uh, excitons we get by specifying the density of free charges, we must iteratively solve in a self-consistent way this equation. So we fix the density of free charges, which sets the band energy, which sets the density of excitons, and we compare this to the we adapt these two densities and compare it to the photo excitation density if it is not the same then we slightly change the density of free charges and we repeat the process all over again until we find uh, the correct solution with this we can then determine the pr the correct proportion of the of free charges and excitons in the material as a function of the photo excitation density in this figure, you can see the photoexcitation density in the x-axis and the density of, of each species in the y-axis. Notice that it is logarithmic, which means that there are many, many more excitons, which is represented by the solid line, as compared to the free charges, the dashed line. Furthermore, you can see that as we keep increasing the photoexcitation density, at some point the density of free charges saturates to, to some value, while the density of exciton just keeps increasing. Now, as I said before, it is not possible in experiment to, con to measure directly the, these densities. So we must connect the information provided by the probe laser, that is uh, the complex conductivity, with, with the densities that we just computed. This, uh, we will do this by uh, applying this simple model that I'm showing here. 
which introduces some fitting parameters that we can then compare with other other results in the literature so to confirm that our theory gives <coughs> reasonable reasonable physical results specifically we see there that we introduce the the parameter mu which is the frequency dependent mobility which is the main indicator that we will use for determining if our theory gives this correct gives correct results this last figure is the summary of our uh, our, of our results. We have in the x-axis again the photo excitation density and in the y-axis we represent the complex conductivity, the real part as the positive values and the imaginary part as the negative values. The dots correspond to the measured data and the lines are our theoretical predictions. As you can see, the experimental data is reasonably well reproduced by our theory and the values that we obtain for the mobilities that are shown in the legend can be compared against the literature to see that, for, that we obtain something very reasonable for cadmium selenide. So we can say, in summary, that our theory works reasonably well for this for these experiments and th th these densities and temperatures i would like to finally thank you for watching and if you are more inter if you are interested in reading more about this topic i leave here five references that you can follow first about the experimental and theoretical models and then about further improvements of the theoretical a framework and finally more analysis of the experimental data.